people can start losing weight just by making better decisions. Motivation is driven from the inside out. Use flexibility as a tool. Rely on structure when it's helpful. This is where we discuss the possibilities. Hey guys, Joe Klimczewski, founder of The Diet Doc, here with Dr. Corey Probst, and we are in another episode of The Diet Doc Life Mastery Podcast. Today we're going to hit the motivational category, Corey, and I know yesterday that we talked about intuitive eating, and I said instead of using versus mm -hmm. structure, we're going to say and structure. Mm -hmm because we need to merge some of these principles and stop looking at everything as opposites and polar extremes. So you had some really good insight yesterday that made me think, gosh, we need to really tie in some of the psychological health motivational insights into this topic. So what do you got for us? Well, so here's what's interesting. After yesterday, I got on Google love Google, <laughs> but thought, I'm, I'm just going to look and see what is out there in terms of intuitive eating and mindful eating and dieting. And I went immediately to images and everything was versus huh. intuitive versus mindful, the dieting mentality versus the non dieting mentality. And so it just, it brought everything back to the fact that, and, and I oftentimes have to remind myself of this because it's so prevalent in the culture, this versus, that we have always taught our clients how to do this in a mindful, intuitive way. It's the entire reason that we have an entire mindset section in our book and why we have a hunger scale in our book is to use macros as a teaching tool to understand what our bodies need and how to listen to our bodies and to understand what's going to be most appropriate for them at different times based on what we're doing. So, you know, intuitive eating is really contextual in terms of what's going on in our minds, what's happening within our bodies and what's happening within our environments. So, uh, yeah, that's where we're at. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, the hunger scale in our book because I, I just heard another author talking uh, about the process of writing a book and he said, man, you know, once you're done with a book, you're usually just so sick of the topic, you put it away and you never think about it again. And I'm kind of guilty of that. I know we have this 377 page Bible of nutrition and everything <laughs> you need to know to live your best life. And I couldn't tell you half of what's in there at this point. So, yeah. so you have some great tools. I know I've told people all the time, when you read 50 Days to Your Best Life, you're going you're gonna to hear all of the mechanical things you need to know about nutrition, flexible mm -hmm. dieting, precision meal planning. But when you get to Corey's stuff about uh, mindset and everything you need from a psychological perspective, that's where it's really going to make sense. So mm -hmm. you mentioned the hunger scale. What, what else or what tools do you have in that book that you think are paramount to people's success? Yeah, so there's the hunger scale, and that's really helping an individual to reflect upon the different levels of hunger that we can go through at any one time during the day. And, you know, I'll talk with my clients about how I am hungriest in the first half of the day. And there are reasons for this. I train right when I get up. And so my metabolism is going to be a bit higher. So when we're looking at intuitive eating, it's paying attention to things like that. You know, you, you have, when you're feeling so, so full that you have to unbutton your pants and you're just, you're just incredibly uncomfortable. And then you're so, so hungry. This is the other end of the scale where people would recognize the term hangry where you're shaky, you're probably low blood sugar a bit, you know, you may be sweating. That's not a time to avoid getting food. <laughs> but if we're subscribing to the diet mentality, it's, I'm just going to suffer through this. I'm just going to suffer through this. I don't have enough food left for the day. There's a very specific mindset that goes along with that. And so even though we're helping our clients to learn macros, it's not about avoiding 
what our bodies are are telling us the the symptoms and the signs that we can read from our bodies so that's one example that's the hunger scale and, and, it's a, and it's a great example, if I could interrupt for a second, of, you know, you, you and I talk a lot about this on, on the podcast, which is to objectify the experience you're having. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not to say that's all we do with our brains, but <laughs> in those moments when you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm on the edge of doing something I might regret or I'm not, yeah, you know, I, I know this is a trigger for me, right. just to be able to step back and say, oh, wait a second. I spent a few minutes creating this hunger scale, one to 10, let me think exactly how hungry I am. And you could even put notes in there as you just did mentally, like this is what happens, this is how I know I'm at a three, this is how I know I'm at a seven. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a great way just to relax for a second and think, which will probably then help you make a much better decision. To, to, to do that pause, like we've talked about before, to breathe and then ask ourselves a powerful question, like, where am I right now? What's the situation that's yeah. moved me into this mental space, this mindset of urgency? And that's what gets a lot of our clients, quote unquote, in trouble a lot of times because the thoughts that they're having are, oh my God, I'm starving, I'm gonna die. Wait, pause, breathe, really? <laughs> so to your point about objectifying, it, it really, we can change that word to being mindful to being a bit more aware in that moment that no, that's not actual reality, that's just a thought, and that I'm starving, I'm gonna die, is creating the anxiety that has the potential to push us into food when it's not necessarily what we need in that moment. It is so simple, but yet so effective <laughs> and so powerful. Yeah. Crazy. All um, right, what else you got in there? Okay, so we have what, I call a completion of fit. So these are in moments either where something has gone really, really well for us, that something we consider a success. Um, we're asking ourselves the question, what contributed to this behavior or process or success? Let me look in every area of my life, my relationships, um, you know, maybe I'm involved in school, maybe I, what, what's happening at work, in every different context of my life, what possibly contributed to this success? And the point of this activity is to really reflect upon the drivers because we want to know what those are so that we can capitalize on them. So what I, what I do, have my clients list everything, even if it sounds silly as heck. And then what we'll do is we'll pick the top two or three that we could manipulate in some way to set more goals around because those were the biggest drivers. Those are what really contributed the most to that success. On the flip side, say that we've had a setback, we've made a mistake, we've indulged in something, uh, we didn't plan on on it and now we're feeling bad, let's use that to our advantage, okay? This, this part of the mindset I'm talking about, let's look at that as an opportunity. So let's do a completion of fit, okay, on the setback. What I do, take a piece of paper, put the setback in a circle, and then it's like a brainstorming session. What were all the drivers, everything that possibly contributed to that mistake, okay? What in that list can I possibly manipulate now? What things can I have an influence over? Pick one or two or three. What are the steps I'm going to take now? So that's another one. Another, Joe, you also mentioned triggers. Mm -hmm. So there's an exercise in there that has us get really digging deep in terms of what we're possibly triggered by. Just to begin paying attention in all different environments about what's difficult, like what poses a challenge? Is it when we're around certain people? <laughs> Is it when we're in certain places, certain restaurants, when we're around certain foods? Um, and so to get really well acquainted with what we could possibly engage in <laughs> that we don't necessarily want to. And then that puts us in a position to be able to plan ahead better. 
You know, yeah. this, this reminds me, I'm, I'm a big reader. And so if I were to read through your section of this book, I would say, wow, that's amazing. That's smart. It's obvious. I need to do this. But then I probably wouldn't do it physically because it takes more work. But every time I have worked with a therapist, counselor, life coach, and I've paid them, you know, hey, here's 200 bucks an hour yeah. and I want to accomplish this goal, I, I will do what they tell me to do because yeah. now I've given them that, that power and, and it's amazing. I mean, I've gone home and I've done exercises they've told me to do. I've journaled things they've told me to journal Mm -hmm. And reading something cannot do that. You have to physically right. do the things you're talking about. So, well, and with the coach too, Joe, they're going to provide perspectives for you that you're unable to see. We don't absolutely. know what we don't know. Yeah. You know, to your point, I'm, I'm working with a girl right now as part of my mental edge program. She's tracking her own macros. I'm not monitoring her nutrition. She came to me because of binge eating, right? Well, you know, we've been working together for probably three months. She's been incredibly successful in no longer binge eating. She decided on her own, you know what? I, I want to practice eating well in a different way. So I'm not going to track macros for a while. So she did that for about a month. Things were going fine. And she recognizes, notice I use the word and, not but. Mm -hmm. And she recognizes that, you know, as much as I'm learning to trust myself and as much as I've been working on, because what I suggested is we need to work on eating as an act of self-compassion. Because a lot of times macros are taken to an extreme to the point where like we have to eat up to them. You know, we've already planned our meals. And so we have to stick exactly to the meals that are on the, the meal plan. I have clients who they'll email me and they're like, man, I was sick as a dog, just felt awful. But I really tried to stuff in all my food. And I'm like, what? What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> like, he, okay, your body is your body knows how to take care of itself in that situation. Don't try to stuff food in your face. And then too, like in stressful situations, man, I, I'm going through this, this work thing right now and I just really didn't feel like eating, but I ate anyway and I tried to eat all my macros. And I'm like, look, let me explain what's happening when you're to your body when you're experiencing stress. It doesn't want food. <laughs> <laughs> and it said that to you, and yet you ate all your macros anyway. In situations like that, don't force it. But so this client, she's eating as, as an act of self-compassion. She's not binging anymore, but she recognizes that she still has more body fat than she feels comfortable with. It's not a healthy amount of body fat. And so she's like, I really, like she's scared. I really don't know if I should start tracking macros again. The act of counting is really kind of like it's, I'm freaking out about how that's going to affect me. I'm worried that I'm going to binge. And so what we're talking about is just using macros as a tool to learn about how to eat better as an act of self-compassion. So she starts tracking. She does good for, she does well. She does really well. She feels really really good for about a week. And then she emails me and she's like, Corey, I had a binge. It was a really, really bad binge. I know, I know that I binged because I'm tracking macros. And here's what I recognized. I recognize that I had this thought that like I was halfway through the day and I had this thought, oh my God, I don't have any, I'm not going to have any food left. And that's when I just had, you know, all of these urges to binge. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, hang on a second can we reassess what the cause of the binge was? Because it doesn't sound to me like it was tracking macros that was the cause. Let's go back to the thought that you said you recognized, which was, oh my God, I'm not going to have any food left. Okay. Here's what we're going to be working on. <laughs> so 
that's part of intuitive eating is working to understand how we are influencing our own behavior just by the thoughts that we get snagged by. That's what created the, the, the binge mentality for her, not the act of tracking macros. And I think that's a great point in making people look at those underlying thoughts and emotions because I, I, I just went back in my mind as you were describing her struggle to uh, when I had just turned pro as a bodybuilder. Mm-hmm. And so there was a lot of anxiety. Oh my gosh, this is the big time now. Like I've got to really suck it up and work hard and be better than ever. And there was one particular season I remember that I, I am just, I'm not really a binger. I don't really have a difficult time overeating in one sitting. But at this particular contest season, I was falling apart. <laughs> and I kept looking at triggers as food based. So I would, I would binge on peanut butter and then I would say, okay, I can't eat peanut butter anymore. Mm-hmm. And then I got down to where the only thing that had any flavor were protein bars. And so one time at one setting, I ate six full-size protein bars. And yeah, right. I probably went through a lot of toilet paper the next day. But, you know, so I kept, I kept looking at foods. Oh, this is the problem. This is the problem. This is the problem. And as you're saying, you know, it was probably just this massive amount of anxiety. And mm-hmm. if I would have addressed that, it could have been a whole different ballgame. Right. And the thoughts that were creating that, that anxiety and the way in which you were interpreting that anxiety. Because you said, like, I felt all this pressure. Pressure for what? You, there were clearly expectations. And, you know, you were often running in a story about what if I don't win? And, oh, my God, what's going to happen? And you were all catastrophizing and everything. <laughs> Who, me? Dr. Joe. (laughs) Yeah, you should try that sometime. Instead of like the hot dog eating contest, that kind of thing, see how many protein bars you can eat in a row. See, okay, so I love that you brought up protein bars because let's talk intuitive eating. Don't eat the stuff you don't like. That's part of intuitive eating. Just because it's on a meal plan for a diet, if you don't like it, don't put it in your face. Because, and, you know, I mentioned in, the, in our last podcast, I'd, I'd had a bunch of clients over for dinner. And the, the guy was talking about how I tried, I tried beets again. I did not like them as a child. He's like, but I wanted to have an open mind. And my wife made beets. And he's like, and I still don't like them. And I'm like, okay, have you tried fresh roasted beets? Because his wife boiled them. (laughs) He's like, yes. And I still don't like them. Do you like them cold in salads, for example? No, they're still awful. And that's where we, you know, we had this conversation about then why push it? You know, I hate protein bars. And I won't eat them even if they're convenient because I, ugh. They're unsatisfying. I'm hungrier after I eat them than before I eat them. And so it's that too, that learning process of what do you like? What do you really enjoy? What is nourishing to you? Don't just stuff food in your face because it's there and everyone else says you should. You know, there are, (laughs) here's another example. I've been, you've been at camps where Boxes of donuts are brought in. We're all going to work out. Like, let's bring in some crap food. (laughs) Right? And, I mean, I'll admit, they looked really, really good. And I'm not a huge donut person. I don't get all jazzed up about donuts. Part of my thing is, if eating is an act of self-compassion, why would I fuel with crap food if I'm going to go do something really good for my body? Like it doesn't add up for me. I know a lot of people don't, you included, maybe agree with that. Like you'll eat cake, you'll eat hundred percent cookies, Every whatever day. before work out, and that's Twice totally day, fine. <laughs> that's intuitive eating for you, and you like that stuff. But but the part of self compassion for somebody like me is to say, I also value my health and and mm-hmm. just my my athleticism, that kind of thing. So 
how, how much do I really need? You know, is a bite enough? Is one half of a serving enough? Is, is maybe once a week enough? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's the key in trying to merge intuitive eating with some structure, yeah. even with the intuitive eating parts of your life or your day, you should say there's still a level of responsibility yes. that is more fulfilling and keeps me happier long term than just another bite of this. Exactly. How am I going to feel if I eat this? Is this something that I actually really enjoy? And to your point, you know, how much, how much is appropriate right now? Am I, am I just eating because it's there, you know, and because people are pressuring me? I'm not a big drinker either. And so that's another thing. Like if I'm honoring my body in the way that feels appropriate for me, like I can't tell my clients, you know, this is the way that I eat. This is the way that I look at things. So this is the way you should do it too. But when I do share with them, you know, my points of view on things, it gives them a new perspective that they probably haven't thought about before. And that's part of that. That's part of what intuitive eating is all about. It's being able to see what the alternatives are and being in this growth space to learn about what we like, what we don't, what we're willing to move or shift within. And that's very different than what has been culturally sanctioned as a diet mentality and what a diet looks like and um, how to do a diet, which is all about deprivation and, you know, not caring for our bodies well. Um, looking at exercise in many ways as punishment for overindulging, you know, that's not intuitive or, and or macro-based uh, eating. Right. And, and what comes to mind, and, and I'll, I'll wrap this up with this little mantra or meme, mm -hmm. is that one of the definitions of intelligence is to be able to handle multiple realities at one time or to kind of transcend time and say, well, this is what I think in this moment, but what about later? What about tomorrow? What about the scope of my entire uh, goal process I'm mm -hmm. in? And mm -hmm. so how can I weave all of those things together and say it really does take some structure? That's, that's a friendly concept, but I can still be intuitive with that and move it around. And you know, it, it's one of those things, if, if you guys are watching this in real time, in the week that we post it, we're in the middle of a 50 days to your hottest summer event where you get to learn things like this on a team. So instead of the normal diet doc process of working with clients one-on-one, -on -one, we've got teams of coaches working with teams of clients so that we can compete and have a challenge for prizes and cool stuff. But it really, my whole premise underneath this is to get people working together in dynamic groups where we can feed into each other's journeys and mm -hmm. share it, you know, create kind of a best practices in a very encouraging social setting. So mm -hmm. I know Corey, you and I have a great team that we're building. I'm excited about that. Yeah. I hope we get more. We got until Friday for enrollment, but we also have 15 other coaches who are mm -hmm. out there creating some amazing teams. So uh, we're going to keep posting more information about this guys. And as always with our podcast, we hope that you give us some comments and direction feedback for that. And we will see you next time. Thanks, guys.